Hi everyone, welcome to the Daily Homeroom live stream. We have a exciting, I guess we could call it a show today. Uh, just to get everyone on the same page what this thing even is, if you're showing up for the first time, we're doing these uh, live streams as a way to stay connected during school closures. Uh, when we started seeing the school closures, it now seems a lifetime ago, but it was, I guess it was four or five weeks ago, we realized that all of us at Khan Academy with, as a not-for-profit with a mission of providing a free world-class education for anyone anywhere, uh, that we had to step up and we had to figure out how to support all of you as parents, as teachers, and students as much as possible. So we started publishing things like daily schedules to structure all of the content on Khan Academy, learning plans, teacher, parent webinars, and also this home room. And it's a place to talk about everything, uh, the closures themselves, the economy, COVID virus, uh, many times just ask any questions you have. Uh, we have an awesome guest today. I encourage you, it's going to be Melody Hobson. I'll give a better introduction for her in a few seconds. Uh, but uh, feel free to start asking questions on the message boards, either for myself or for Melody especially. I want to give everyone a, a reminder, we are not for profit. We are uh, funded primarily through philanthropic donations. And so if you are in a position to do so, please think about donating to Khan Academy. We were already running at a deficit before school closures, and now our traffic is almost 3x of what it typically is. And you can imagine we're trying to do more in, the, in this context. So if you're, uh, for us to be able to do the work for folks who might not be able to afford, uh, anything is appreciated. I, I do want to give a special shout out to several corporations who stepped up in the last uh, few weeks uh, to really, especially around the COVID response, Bank of America, Fastly, Novartis, Google.org, and AT&T. So with that, I'm eager uh, to have as much time with our guest as possible. I've known our guest, Melody, for some time. Melody Hobson is the co-CEO and president of Aerial Investments. Uh, and, you know, there's two things I really am eager to talk to you about, Melody. One is just your journey to becoming co-CEO of what I think is one of the most important investment firms in the world. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> Your, your, your view of the economy, you know, we, we've brought, had a couple of folks on in the investment management world, and it's just in interesting times, to, to put it lightly. So, so maybe a good place to start, Melody, you know, t tell us, there's a lot of young people watching who are trying to figure out their life, what does, should they do with their life. Tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you end up becoming the co-CEO of Aerial Investments? Well, thank you so much for having me on, Sal, and just know that I'm such a big fan of yours, as you know all too well from the first time I came to see you. I told you I was just enamored by all the things you were doing to teach so many people all around the world, and I applaud your efforts and just feel so much gratitude that you have things like that, that, that ex like this that exist for people all over the world. I'm also honored to be asked to be um, one of the people that you interview and to tell my story. My story, I think, is the story of many people um, around the world in so many ways, just a story of persistence and really, really hard work. I grew up in Chicago and I was the youngest of six children. My mom was a single mom. And when I was growing up, we had a really, at times, uh, challenging existence to say the least. Sometimes we got evicted, sometimes our phone got disconnected, lights got, got cut off. We'd live in some of the abandoned apartments that my mom used to try to fix up and rent for people in order to make a living. And it's during that time that I became clear that I was desperate to understand money, not make it, not have a lot, understand it. I thought if I could understand money, I could have a better life. And I really committed myself to that. When I was 19 years old, I had the opportunity to be an intern at Aerial Investments, which was this fledgling investment firm started by this wonderkin named John Rogers, who started the company when he was 24 years old. Today, we're 37 years old now. And after I graduated from college, I went back and worked at the firm in 1991 after graduating from Princeton. And I've only had one job since then. And I started off on the client services and marketing side, learning everything I could learn about investing in the stock market. And over time, rose up in the organization in May of 2000, I became president. I went from intern to president. And then last summer in 2019, I became co-CEO. It's an amazing story in so many ways. And I have so much gratitude for the opportunity I've been given. But most of all, I have the most amount of gratitude for what I've been able to learn about money and investing over this near 30 year career that I've been doing this and how that has really uh, put in me a fire to teach what I know to other people so that they can have a better life. And what's your sense, what, what do you think made your trajectory so successful? What do you think were the traits in it, 
that that made you a successful investor uh, and and it allowed other people to recognize it as well well i think the first thing that helped me was that i always believe that you have to always be learning always that i ever have felt even today that i know enough and that i can stop and so having that open mind some people call it a beginner's mind that's a buddhist concept that your mind is always new like a child and you're approaching everything from the perspective of a beginner allows you to um, really take in a lot of information. Ray Kroc, who started at McDonald's, had a quote that I really liked where he says, you know, as long as you're green, you grow. When you're ripe, you rot. And I really like that concept of just staying green all the time and being open, not being so convinced that you know everything. I think that made a difference. Secondly, a commitment to learning. We call ourselves a learning culture at Ariel. We always want to build on what we learned from before. So right now being in this global pandemic, we're building on all the knowledge we learned in the financial crisis of 2008 and nine. And then during that period, we built on the things that we learned in 9-11. And that we built on things we learned in the crash of 87. So it's like constantly accumulating knowledge that will make you better and building on it so you have more and more muscle memory. And the last thing is just, I love the idea of learning about the markets, talking about companies, really understanding how money works around the world. It just really fascinates me. And so I think it's very important. You, you become more successful at something that you really like. And I just really love the business that I'm in. And at the end of the day, I tell our team that we work with, we get to make people's lives better because we grow their money in their pension fund or their kids' college education money that's in our mutual funds, whatever it might be, so that they can have a better outcome. And that's as fulfilling as anything that anyone could do, as fulfilling as you teaching maybe, as fulfilling as doctors who are doing what they do. We feel that our work is that important. And we're getting a lot of questions off of YouTube and social media, which is great. Uh, for Aditya Gupta, and this is a good starter question. You know, a lot of people are kind of vaguely familiar. Okay, there are these things, these investment funds. But his question is, what what does Aerial Investments do? And maybe I'll extend his question. What is the day? What is your day like? And and maybe what is it like when you started? What does an investment like, manager and analyst do? So let's start off with Aerial Investments. Does we are a boutique independent money management company. We manage stock portfolios for big institutions. So think states, cities, foundations, um, whole host of organizations, often pension, but it could be endowment money as well. And then for individuals, we have publicly traded mutual funds that anyone can invest with us who has as little as $50 a month to put in our mutual funds. We buy domestic companies, U.S. companies that are small and medium-sized companies that are out of favor but show a strong potential for growth. And over the years, we've owned everything from companies that you know, they usually dominate the niche that they're in. Everything from Smucker's Jelly, which is in the portfolio right now. In the past, we've owned things like Tiffany's, the retailer, and Clorox, the, the, the diversified consumer products company. So you name it, those companies that dominate a niche, we say once you get the customer, they go back again and again, small and medium-sized companies. And then we have international and global portfolios. International means it's only companies based outside of the United States, and global means it's companies all over the world, including the United States. And those portfolios also seek to invest in companies that are out of favor. And that's everything from higher companies to uh, um, the version of, uh, of what you would have in America with some of our internet businesses that are based in China, like Baidu. So we're looking for these brands and franchises, and we want businesses that will be able to grow over time, but we want to buy them when they're out of favor, when for whatever reason they've been cast aside. So as you might imagine right now, during a time when the stock market has been so volatile, there have been a lot of buying opportunities that have come to us. So these days we're super busy. But when you ask about my day, I am actually not an investment analyst, although I am um, someone whose Rolodex is, is used on a regular basis to inform the stocks that we are buying. So in this current environment, I've been on the phone on many occasions with my co-CEO, calling 
friends in the industry talking about what they're seeing in the market because we can learn from everyone, including, we called his old corporate finance teacher, someone named Bert Malkiel, who wrote a book called The Random Walk Down Wall Street that is so famous. I think it's in its ninth edition. To say, what do you think of this environment? But we'll also call very famous money managers and ask them that as well. Now we do our own independent work and our own independent thinking, but we can learn from anyone. And then our team would be spending lots of time on the phone talking to management teams of companies that we own, asking them what their prospects for the business are, what has changed, what is the same, how are they managing through the period, and most important of all, do, have, do they have the liquidity to get them to the other side? And I say the other side because this will end at some point. It won't be forever. At some point, there will be a vaccine. At some point, we will go back to life as we know it. We don't know how long that will be. And so the most important thing is to understand from those companies that they have the balance sheet and the wherewithal to be, with, uh, to be able to withstand whatever kind of pain they will feel during this period. I spend an enormous amount of time on the phone talking to our clients and shareholders, writing to them, writing the communications, explaining what we're doing so that they're as informed as possible and there are no surprises when it comes to our portfolios and how we're investing and performing. And well, you're touching on, I think, where a lot of the questions are, which are, uh, where's the economy going? But before I go into that, there's something you said that's interesting that I think a lot of people could learn from. You know, the, the fact that you're looking at companies that are out of favor, uh, that might be counterintuitive for some. So uh, where is the, what's the hypothesis there? And also, I'm fascinated by your logo, which is a turtle. So, um, and maybe those two things are connected. Well, we believe that real money is made over time. And all of our beliefs come, by, come from studying the investment grades. The, ingress, the greatest investor of our modern time is Warren Buffett, the CEO and chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, who still happens to be alive, who is one of the greatest track records in investing of any human being ever. And so we've thought a lot about what he's written about and talked about. And he talks about time is the friend of uh, the wonderful investor, the enemy of the mediocre. And so we think about that fact that we want to invest in things that over the long term will demonstrate growth. And there may be a reason that it's temporary out of favor. Maybe an entire industry got taken down at once and a good company went down with it. And so we're looking for those, those opportunities to be able to buy companies when for whatever reason something has gone wrong. So a simple example of that, We've been buying a company recently that's in the, the dental industry, and that's very much of late. And the reason that it's compelling is because we say to ourselves, okay, we get it. When you're sheltered in place, no one can go to the dentist. So the earnings and revenue on that business just fall off a cliff. There's no question about it. So then our next question is, can they manage through this period for a significant period of time, not knowing when it'll be over? They're best in class at what they do. And when things get up and running again, we believe most people will go back to the dentist. In fact, there'll probably be some pent up demand there. So that would be an example of out of favor, but shows potential for long-term growth. When you think of around the world, more and more people go to the dentist. I'll give you another quick example, medical related. We own a company called Zimmer that makes hips and knees. And they literally, it's the, a doctor gets trained on one device and they use that device all the time. So it's, in our mind, a razor, razor blade business. The doctor is the razor, the customer is the razor blade. So the customer comes through and gets hips and knees over and over again. Again, during this pandemic, no elective surgery. Having a, a bad hip or knee doesn't kill you, but it might really hurt. So people can't go to the doctor and get their hip replaced. But we're looking at the demographics that show this very basic math that shows baby boomers are going to need hips and knees. For every one pound you gain, it's four pounds on your knees. So while, again, there may not be surgeries right now, over time, not only will it recover, but we say that's going to, unfortunately, be a growing industry. So that's what we mean about buying things when they're out of favor. No, it's very compelling. And for those who don't know, my old job, I was an analyst at a, at a hedge fund at a much more junior level than, than Melody. But my boss always used to say, 
you know, when you're buying, there's someone smart selling to you. And when you're selling, there's someone smart buying. So what do you think your edge is? And Melody's edge, and it sounds like it's very much aligned with the Warren Buffetts of the world, is that most people think relatively short to medium term and kind of move with the herd and move with emotion. And if you can somehow separate yourself from that and be a little bit contrarian sometimes, you might be able to, time could be your friend. And that speaks to our logo. And we'd say be a lot contrary. And the number of calls that I've gotten from everything from working class individuals who are trying to make ends meet saying, my 401k plan or 43B plan is getting crushed, to billionaires that we work for who say, I'm thinking of selling. You don't sell into the panic. Buffett has this quote, buy the panic. There's another famous line, you wanna be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. So during a time of fear and panic, indiscriminate selling, which we saw in early March, we're going to be thinking, where are the opportunities? Again, there's that famous line. I think it's Churchill who said, don't let an oper- a crisis go to waste. And so that you say during that crisis, just from an investment standpoint, what are the opportunities that might just be being thrown away where people are just running for cover, which is actually the ro- you, you should never sell into that kind of down market. That's why we have a turtle as a logo. And we talk about slow and steady winning the race, like Aesop's fable. And don't get the sense that we mean slow and being like we're not doing anything. We are urgently patient. Like we are looking for opportunities at all time. But we take our time and we're thinking of what will this company be over the next three to five years, not the next three to five quarters. I like that phrase, urgently <laughs> patient. I think I need to be a little bit more of that myself. <laughs> I have the urgency. I need the more, more of the, more of the patience. So we. But that's really what of, we are. We're yeah. urgently patient. We're looking at it with urgency, but we're taking a long-term view about what it'll be. That's great, and we're getting a ton of questions you could imagine about the economy itself, and you know those those businesses that you just talked about make a ton of sense, at least even with my old investment hat on. Uh, but a lot of people, and we had Ray Dalio on last week, and you know the the there's kind of contrasting trends here. We saw the market go down a lot and then it's kind of gone back up uh, to a reasonable level. It seems to me, as someone who's not doing this as my day job anymore, that the market got reasonably optimistic maybe once we hit the peak of the crisis and things like that. Uh, But on the other hand, when you look at the jobless claims numbers, you you think about, well, even if a state does open up, will people really go to restaurants or dentists or whatever else? It could be a while. How do you think the market has it wrong? Do you think uh, there's something else at play here? What's y'all's macro read? So we are bottom-up stock pickers, so we're looking at companies, just one company at a time. What will it be over the long term? And we like it best when those companies don't get uh, you know, beaten up and down by what's going on from a macro perspective. But in this environment, that's unavoidable. What we would say is that we, we don't think of the market as being right or wrong. It just is. And so from that perspective, our work is to try to be thoughtful around what is occurring. And the market, what it typically does, it it anticipates the future. It looks out into the future and and has some sense of what it thinks will happen. And that's obviously as a result of a cluster of people buying and selling, et cetera. And there's no question with the recovery we've seen in such a short period of time, the market is anticipating better days ahead for the economy. Perhaps they're they're thinking the recovery will be faster than what everyone thought in early March when shares were being indiscriminately sold. And so we would say that is what it is. It could be wrong. We might have a W where we go down again. We may have stay-at-home orders again in the fall. We don't know. We have thought more that it might look more like a U that we'd have this period through the rest of the year where you would not expect a lot out of corporate America, especially in terms of profitability or earnings. And then you'd start to see a recovery in 2021, which to us is like a nanosecond in investing. That is the scenario with which we're working against, but we can be wrong and still be right. Because remember, we're thinking long-term and we're not making investments. We're not trading based upon the next three to six months. It's nice to be have the rec- market recover the way it has, but we also know that it has been a very, very volatile period, and these things can turn turn on the dime, turn on a dime. I think our biggest concern right now is if we come out 
way too fast and way too early that people, you know, could be in a situation where if they have to lock down again, that might be very, very upsetting. So we will just have to play it by ear and see here. And for us, it's really to take advantage of the opportunities as they come. And these businesses, like say these are associated with the dental industry or hip replacement that when you are in a stay in place order, or maybe even once we're out of the stay in place order uh, and you're allowed to go, but most people will try not to go until there's a vaccine or something. How long, when you're looking at how long they can be solvent with, you know, little revenue, what, what time horizon are y'all looking at? Is it six months, 18 months? We were looking longer? at, yeah, we, we, we were looking at the next six to 12 months, yes. And saying if they're really, really compromised during that period, will these businesses, do they have the balance sheet that they can be okay? That's the question we're asking ourselves. And that's not a yes for certain industries. I mean, we're gonna see bankruptcies come out of this environment. We've already started to see that. And there are whole sectors that are really, really taking it on the chin. I mean, it's, you know, the airline industry is going to be compromised. There's no question about it because that's an industry where capital expenditures are very, very expensive. You've got big labor issues. Now they're benefiting from loyal, lower oil prices but there are a whole bunch of things that can hit them. And so that would be an industry that we'd say, we just don't, we don't, we don't know what'll happen there. That goes into the too hard category for us, but there'll be a whole bunch of other areas where you can again, look out and say, literally, you know, I know like if my crown breaks, I'm going to the dentist that, you know, it's just, it's not going to be a question. Yeah. And I know y'all are bottoms up and actually the fund I used to work for was very, very similar to a much smaller scale. Uh, but I am, I'm sure you do have a, a view on, uh, I mean, you just gave a little bit of view on the macro, but what, what, from a policy point of view, if you were the chairman of the Federal Reserve or if you were the Treasury Secretary, do do you, what what kind of actions do you think need to be taken or not taken uh, to get us through this? Well, I have to say I applaud what they have done so far. I was in a board meeting with someone and they said um, the Federal Reserve didn't bring a bazooka. They brought the whole arsenal. And that is true. This is a giant contrast to the 08, 09 financial crisis. When I remember Hank Paulson, who was then Treasury Secretary, going and presenting to Congress and asking for a stimulus bill that was $750 billion and them initially turning him down. And he didn't needed that money to rescue American banks. And that was one of those daunting moments. The market just literally cratered on that bad news. This is just the opposite. Congress has an open checkbook, which has its own repercussions potentially down the road. But today, you want to be in the business of doing too much versus too little. And they're approaching this in exactly that manner. Now, that said, I want those stimulus checks to get to individuals faster because that has been problematic um, at certain levels. And I think the small business um, PPP is also uh, challenged in terms of how fast people are getting money and are is everyone getting that equal access to the opportunity to participate. So those things I think we've got to get on. The one thing I'll also say, they did a really good job with the furlough situation that when employees get furloughed, they're getting their full compensation, which um, incents companies not to lay those people off. And um, so I think that's really, really good. And I think the unemployment benefits given the number of people who've had to file claims at the end of the day, I think they did the right thing um, there as well. And especially with putting on the extra for children. And there was a lot there that was, I think, very, very thoughtful and, um, and the right thing to do. I just don't think it's over. I think we're looking at more stimulus, not less. And, and there's tons of questions here, but one follow-up question to that. What do you think are the long-term implications? To your point, you know, in, in times of emergency, you can think in very fundamental terms. There is food out there. We just need to, have to make sure people have currency to buy the food. Uh, there is shelter. We need to make sure they have currency to pay that rent. Uh, but in order to do so, you know, trillions of dollars potentially of increasing the, the debt. Uh, what, what do you think are the long-term implications, if any? Inflation is likely a long-term implication. I mean, when we've talked to a number of experts out there and academics, um, they're pretty united in their point of view. Um, when Rome is burning, you know, if your house is burning down, you're not thinking about the rebuild at that point. You're thinking about putting out the fire. So right now we're still in the put out the fire mode, and then we'll have to figure out the, the, the environment afterwards and what we do about that. But again, I think there is no other action that could be taken than the actions that have been taken thus far.
Yeah. Now we have this question from uh, Tamika Rogers on YouTube. And you've touched on this already, uh, but I'll, I'll ask it again because I'm sure a lot of people are asking this. Uh, Ms. Hobson, is this the perfect time to invest in the stock market? Well-known companies mostly that you, I guess she's asking, would it be well-known companies mostly that you expect to thrive in two to five years, which does sound aligned with y'all's thinking. So this is what I would say. First of all, um, I do think there are some opportunities out there, not as many as there were a month ago when things were worse. But what I would say, you know, Warren Buffett says it's a market of stocks, not a stock market. So there are companies always for sale in the stock market, even when the stock market is at highs. I would caution people to make sure they have the right perspective. And I think you have to take a longer term view and not to expect this to be like a rubber band that's recoiled and it just bounces back like that. So just making sure, again, you're looking out and you are patient in your perspective. I also would encourage you to invest in things you know. That's a famous line from another great investor, value investor named Peter Lynch, who was very famous in the 80s. Um, and he talked about you know, investing, within, investing in things that you have a good sense of, as opposed to trying to stretch and, and learn something that, that you don't know or understand. There are certain areas we don't invest in because we do not understand them and we think we're smart. But we tend not to buy commodities because you have to predict them. There are a whole host of things. We don't have a lot of exposure to technology um, because we think there's rapid obsolescence, especially along, among smaller and mid-sized technology companies that you, know, you can be um, put out of business very quickly by another competitor or disrupted very easily and then your value could erode. It's harder for Google now or harder for um, Facebook, but some of this on the smaller end that can be challenging. So we don't tend to do a lot there being very realistic about what you know and understand. I'm not one for tips, stock tips from people, anything like that. And if you don't have the stomach for this, don't do it. Get a professional, buy mutual funds, that you have investment professionals like us at Ariel that are actually doing the work and worrying about this on a day-to-day -day basis. And actually, just a curious question. This is something I always struggled with uh, when I was in the same field is, you have a strong thesis, you've done your homework, you've made your investment, and y'all are famously patient about it. But I'm sure, well, I'm, my question is, are there sometimes that you are unsure about yourself? And do you, have you, how do you draw the line between doubling down on your bet versus saying, maybe I was just wrong and, and getting out of it? And obviously there's parallels to life there, but you're living it every day in the investment world. So first we have this point that we make with our investment team and we say, we hold our ideas lightly, not dearly. So we hold them lightly so that we have the ability with new information to change our minds. It's very important because investing, you don't need a, as again, quoting Buffett, a perfect batting average to be successful. And so as a result of that, you're going to make mistakes. You must accept that. One of the greatest pieces of advice I got was my, from my co-CEO and business partner. Once I was agonizing over something and he said, you know, Melody, I don't agonize over mistakes because I make them frequently. And you really have to have a little bit of a move on mentality. You make it, what did you learn from it? And you move on. And there are times we've absolutely made mistakes and we want to internalize those lessons. One of the periods where we made mistakes was in 2008, 2009, where we underperformed for the first time in a down market and we underperformed significantly. And we went back and completely overhauled our balance sheet work and how we were doing it and making sure companies had the wherewithal for tough periods. And we think that those learnings allowed us to survive this period and endure this period much better than we did before, as an example. And so we make mistakes with stocks all the time and the simple question we ask our analysts, this is an easy way to think about it. We don't allow our analysts to say hold. Some companies, you have a buy, a hold, or a sell. We say you're either a buyer or a seller. You must pick. If you don't want to buy it, you want to sell it. And in some ways, that's figurative to us, for us, but it's a way of making people really put a stake in the ground. You either like it or you don't. You can't live in this, this no man's land of hold without you know, showing your hand of what you really believe. That's a fascinating point, because <laughs> I've always thought about it, but I never phrased the way you just said, because your, your, your point is right. If you're holding something, you're essentially saying, if you were buying today, you'd be willing to buy it. Correct. 
definition holding. That's that's a fascinating thing. The, the rest of the industry, <laughs> I think there are a lot, a lot of folks are seeking shelter in that hold position because <laughs> you can't be too right. And the thing all. is, we have to affirm that every day. Right. That's the thing. You 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 can't you can't rationalize that because you've owned it for this you know whatever amount of time. Again, quoting a great investor, the stock doesn't know you own it. It doesn't care. <laughs> So every day you're starting off with the idea that is this better than owning something else? It doesn't matter how long I owned it before. And I really love, you know, that idea of not holding your ideas too tightly. I think there's a, a very big meta wisdom to that. You know, even in life, our egos can get very attached to our points of views or our ideas. Uh, and, and sometimes even become destructive <laughs> in our lives because we hold tight, so tightly to them in the face of new information. So there's something very Zen well, about that. Think about that from the perspective of just politics today and the polarization of ideas around political uh, parties, et cetera. That when people become too wedded to an ideology, it can break down, you know, real progress. And so we really do have this perspective of, that's one of the reasons we believe diverse points of view are so imper important to solving really hard problems and bringing people with all of those diverse points of view that might have a point of view that's very strong, but again, that I'm willing to yield my perspective to a more compelling point of view, as opposed to um, just being wedded to an ideology. Yeah, no, I mean, that's so relevant on, on so many levels. Uh, there's a question here about finance in general, or learning uh, finance uh, from Aditya Gupta from YouTube. How can we learn to start, how, how can we learn how to start learning about finance, investing, and the economy at a younger age? How can we start investing at our ages? So first and foremost, this is one of the things that just, you know, Sal, I came to see you on this topic because the thing that frustrates me so much is that I'm just going to use America as the base for the conversation here. You can go to high school in America today and take wood shop or auto and not a class on investing, which always leads me to ask audiences the same thing. Who's whittling in their spare time? Who's cleaning their own carburetor? No one, right? But when it comes to understanding the basics of the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ, you know, small cap, mid cap, large cap, market capitalization, growth value, all of these things that have some profound um, potential effect on your long-term uh, financial security, we don't teach it. And so that's why opportunities like this are so important. What I believe very strongly is that investing should be caught, taught in school in America at a very young age. I think it should be like learning a language. I have a six-year-old and she takes Spanish at school. She already speaks Chinese. And once you can start early, you become very facile in the language. And I think that's very, very important. One way, if you can't get it in a school, to get them to have it as part of the curriculum, and I say to people, if you have a stockbroker, a financial advisor, um, the person in the local bank that may know something about investments, maybe they can come in and teach a class for your nephew or your child or what have you, so you get a sense of these important concepts. Um, the, the children get a sense of these important concepts. If you can't do that, I think a great idea is to do what John Rogers, my business partner's father, did for him. His father was a child of the Depression, an orphan. He moved to Chicago when he was 11 years old. He was in the first class of Tuskegee Airmen, and he wanted John to understand money. And so he gave John stocks every birthday and every Christmas starting when he was 12 years old instead of toys. Now, you may not do the instead of toys part, but certainly having that component be a part of his gift giving really taught John from the very beginning the fundamentals of investing. And you can do that with a child by giving them gifts of stock, of things that they know and like. And that's the gift that keeps giving versus the, to the toy that becomes obsolete at some point. And that could be Mattel, that could be shares of Sony because of PlayStation, that could be McDonald's or Nike, things that the children understand fundamentally or your teen and ultimately may create some interest there that they can watch and understand the benefits of ownership and equity as opposed to just consumer consumerism. Yeah, that's a powerful, yeah, idea. powerful yeah. idea. And I actually think it's talking about edges that I think some younger people, because they think a little bit different, have a different lens, they actually might be able to uh, have a perspective that uh, professionals might not even fu fully, fully have. Uh, there, there's a question here from 
Uh, Leila Torres, uh, it's really praise, but I think it leads to a question. Melody, thanks for being a role model to all females in finance. We don't have many, and it was great to learn about you. And uh, the question I'll ask is, why, why don't we see more females in finance? I think there's a lot of stigma around issues related to math and girls. And, you know, I'm not the first person who's ever said this and it's disappointing and it, it, it continues to exist and it's true. And that therefore um, affects our ranks in both the investment business as well as in engineering and other areas. And I think it's a perception that's just wrong. The data shows it. So we've looked at the investment habits, patterns, and successes of women versus men. And interestingly, women tend to be better investors. Part of the reason that we tend to be better investors, we tend to trade less and be more patient. And that ultimately works in our benefit. And they've looked at lots and lots of decisions that have been made over time to be able to show that. Now that's just rank and file people and their personal investment portfolios. In the industry that I'm in, only 7% of portfolio managers are women. We actually have one in my office that's a great investor named Rupal Bansali, who manages our international and global strategies and has done a phenomenal job. But it's, it's really disappointing to see those numbers haven't moved very much. Now, I think exposure is part of that. They need to see people like Rupal and people like me who love what we do and are in this business and in it to win it. And I think to the extent that girls and teens and college students are aware of the opportunities in our industry and the fulfillment that we get from the work that we do, I think they would be as excited about it as we are. And, and related to that, another comment, this is from Rish, Rishika uh, Telemsetti from YouTube said, uh, Melody Hobson, you are so inspiring to all girls around the world. I'm a girl of color and I'm really inspired by you. And that kind of going with the question from Layla, the, you know, when you went into the industry uh, right out of college, and you looked around, it probably were even fewer women, even fewer people of color. What did, did you ever feel like, hey, how come there's no one like me? Maybe I don't belong or, or and how did you overcome any feelings like that? So I'm smiling because I had a friend once that I asked a question about, you know, being different in the industry, et cetera. And he was like, Melody, how long have you been black? How long have you been a woman? You know, it just comes with the territory when you're a woman or a person of color, you understand what you're up against. I've told stories about how when I was a young girl, my mother told me what I would be up against. And she explained to me, I have it in my TED talk, that people won't always treat me well. She told me that when I was six years old. And it was really something that was very important because it allowed me not to then be defeated by any form of inequity that I saw. I saw the opportunity when I entered the industry in 1991 to be different. And so I joke with people, when I would go to investment conferences, I would be the only one, the only woman of color. And when I go up to people, they'd say, you're Melody, before they'd even met me. And I could have been like Cher or Beyonce, like no last name. <laughs> I stood out. And so I used that standing out to my advantage. I said, okay, there's no one else like me that I'm going to be memorable, as opposed to seeing it as a, a, a cross that I was carrying on my back. It doesn't mean that it was always easy by any stretch of the imagination. The way that I built up my confidence is through knowledge. The more knowledge I have, the more prepared I am, the more confident I am. And I think that's really important. We all know what it takes for us to walk into a room and feel confident. If I was studied in my subject, I could walk in with my head high and with my ideas ready to go. And I think that's a very, very important um, way of conquering um, the world when you can go in with good ideas and not be afraid to say what they are, not be discouraged when they're rejected. Um, I always felt like I could get another job. That was the other thing. I was like, if it doesn't work out here, I'm fully confident in myself. Not because I'm cocky or have a huge ego. I just know I'll do whatever it takes. If tomorrow you told me I couldn't go work at Ariel and I had to go and work at Neiman Marcus or Macy's or uh, Kohl's or you name the store, I'd be the number one salesperson without a doubt because I would do it with that much pa as much passion as I do this proudly. So I really think it's about your own mindset and your own mentality. There are going to be haters. They exist everywhere, a big and small in your own race and your own gender. And there are going to be people who root for you and help you. I just, I decided to ignore those who weren't there to help me try to avoid them as much as possible, make choices that would lead me to people who are more positive and more interested in a better outcome for me. 
and and that doesn't mean I got it perfectly, but more often than not, by giving people the benefit of the doubt, I was more right than wrong. Wow, that's in incredibly wow. inspiring, and I think everyone, you know, everyone has aspects about their being that they might feel a little bit different than others or feel imposter or feel insecure about certain things. But I think the way you framed it right now is uh, inspiring for, for everyone. Uh, Melody, I, I could keep going for hours <laughs> asking you questions and, and, and it looks like YouTube and Facebook could keep going hours as well, but I want to be very sensitive to your time. Thank you so much for, for joining this and I hope you join again. Hopefully you had a good time. There's a lot of questions from a lot of folks here, uh, but this was a, a really inspiring conversation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me and I just really want to end by thanking you for all the work you do, Sal, for so many. You are one of my heroes. I mean that genuinely in my heart and I'm just so proud to know you and to be able to learn from you. Well, you're one of my heroes and uh, it's only been reinforced <laughs> from this conversation. So I'm extra flattered that you even say that, but thank you so much, Melody. It was a thanks. real treat. Bye. So everyone, thanks for uh, joining uh, what, what I found to be a very inspiring conversation uh, with, with Melody. Uh, I, I, a lot of takeaways that I'm gonna be thinking about as I, you know, uh, I have my own, uh, I, I think we all have our own things that we, we deal with in life, but I, I, I just loved uh, Melody's ability to power through and be resilient and optimistic in, 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 the, in the face of sometimes significant adversity. Uh, but anyway, uh, thanks for joining. I hope we can have Melody on in the future as well. Uh, we're going to have some other amazing guests in the next uh, few days and weeks. Uh, and, you know, stay safe, stay healthy in, in these times of, uh, of COVID. Uh, and remind and just remi remind yourself that we're all in this together. Uh, don't try to focus too much on some of the negatives that you hear in the news. There's a lot of positives out there. Uh, and you know, one of the silver linings is we are seeing a lot of humanity step up and, and do the right thing. I'll also just throw out the plug again because it's part of my job. We are not for profit. If you're in a position to do so, uh, please think about making a donation to Khan Academy. It's donations like that that allow us to continue to do this, this work, uh, especially for folks who might not otherwise be able to, to have access to uh, learning materials. Uh, so thank you so much and I will see you tomorrow.